Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bert Lang, and I'd like to welcome you to Skippy Low Looks at Hollywood. Today's guest is the famous, legendary, wonderful Eartha Kitt. And now, without further ado, let's join Skip and his guest. How have you been? Fine. I haven't seen you since about a year ago. When you're first, you're back at the Vine Street Grill. Yes. Packing yes. him in as usual. Well, I'm doing my best. You, you would like to work that room, do you? Yes, I like to work that room very much. It reminds me of the Macombo. Remember the Macombo? Macombo on the Strip. When I opened there, I think it was like 1954. Mm. When we came here with new faces of uh -huh. 1952. Uh -huh. And when I worked that room uh -huh. through the auspices of uh, Charlie Morrison, who owned the place, right. I was also doing new faces down at the Biltmore Theatre. We were making the film of New Faces. At the time? Yes, all at the same time. And I was making records with RCA Victor all at the same time and staying at the Garden of Allah. Tell me. <laughs> and I, I think I was sleeping about two hours a night, if that. Bertha Kid, why, why do you keep yourself so busy in life? You're always a busy woman. You travel all over the world. You're always working. Why, not, why, why so busy? Why not? Why not? Yes. It's nice to be still in the running of things, you know. Uh -huh. when, uh, when you're asked to work, there's mm -hmm. no reason for you to stop. Because that's all I know anyway. True. I've been in the business since I was like knee-high to a grasshopper. Ah, Eartha. And mm -hmm. that's the only thing I know is work. Mm -hmm. And I think if the situation came about that I was not able to work anymore, uh -huh. in show business, that is. Yes. I think I'd, I would then probably go into writing or sticking more to my tapestry. <laughs> 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 but I like working. Uh -huh. I must say, though, Skippy, I don't like to travel as much as I used to. Uh -huh. I find it's not as easy anymore. Uh -huh. Not that I ever look at life as being easy, mm -hmm. but I find that when you travel from places like Australia to Los Angeles, oh, it's tiresome. and also in within two days or something like uh -huh. that, and you know, 20, 27 hours or 18 hours from uh -huh. Australia to Los Angeles, yes. and you know you're being dehydrated, it's one cup of water being taken out of your body uh -huh. per hour. So by the time you land, us girls are looking like <laughs> <laughs> the, the, a witch or something uh, like that. And then you start to lose your, a uh, little bit of your sanity, you know, and it's very difficult to accept. Eartha Kitt, tell me. Franz, Orson Welles, discovered you. Actually, he really discovered you. Actually, I thought my mother did. Your but mother? <laughs> well, she... Okay, I think okay. my mother had something to do with it. She did, yes. But as far as the theater is concerned... Theater? Yes, the oh. legitimate theater is concerned you as far were, as the acting side of the theater, yes. You were in Paris doing the play. Is that correct? I was in Paris. I was still with uh, Catherine Dunham. Ca dancing. I dancing. went to Paris with the ballet company. Yes, yes, The yes. Catherine Dunham Ballet Company. That's right. And that's where Olson Wells saw me. Uh -huh. And he cast me opposite him in his production of Faust, and I played the part of Helen of Troy, mm -hmm. and won the Best Foreign Actress Award you of France did. in that of that year. New York, new faces. What well, happened? That is what brought the attention of me being nominated for uh, the Best Actress. Mm -hmm. Leonard Silman came to you. Uh, I wouldn't. Well, the Willie Morris Agency actually asked me to come back to America for La Vie en Rose. Ah, the club. Yes, the, the club, club La Vie yes, en Rose. wonderful room, yes. Yes, I remember but that it room. wasn't for me at the moment because I was a flop. And Were you a flop then? Oh, yes, because they say I was singing in too many languages. I, I, they say I'm uh, too the different. The Americans weren't ready for Eartha Kitt at that time. Well, I, uh, let's see, I don't know if it was the American public or agents who feel that you're too difficult to categorize. Mm -hmm. And uh, after all, if the American people or any public has a chance to see for themselves, yes. which eventually happened, because mm -hmm. when Leonard Silman saw me then at La Vie en Rose, uh -huh. and uh, he cast me in New Faces of 52, mm -hmm. and the general public had a a better chance of seeing me then, yes. and they decided for themselves as to whether I was good, better, and different. And that's when the shows were stopped, 
I stopped uh, the show in a little song called Pal, Petit Pal, où j'étais connu, souviens-toi, tu n'étais pour moi, ce soir-là, rien qu'on a connu, and Robert Clary translated it. And you'd never think that a little song like that would stop the show. But what really stopped the show for me was when I went across the, across the stage, Monotonous. Growling, growling in monotonous. Monotonous, yes. right, of course. Yes, that and we didn't have number. Yes, and we didn't have an encore for it, so I had to come back uh -huh. and crawl over the chaise lounges again and invent something. A lot of big stars came <coughs> out of New Faces. Leonard Tillman's New Faces. Paul Lynn. Yes. Who else? Alice, Loads. Of Alice stars. Ghostly. Al oh, Alice Ghostly. Right. Yes, I yes. adore yes. Alice Ghostly. I think yes. she's wonderful. Carol yeah. Lawrence. Carol Lawrence. Um, Bob Clary. Robert Clary. And uh, Loads of stars came yes, out of that. a lot of us came out of it, and we were like 17 new faces, really, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that worked together very closely uh -huh. and were very proud of one another. It was like a family with new faces. You said something about William Morris walking down Broadway. You said something once I heard something about Broadway. You said something about a shadow. Tell me about that. I when the way <laughs> I like that. I'm, <laughs> when they they brought me they bring me back to America and it was advertised big page right. ten days before I opened at Levy and Rose, right. and it said, learn how to say Earth the Kids and my name was in very small print, and every day ten days nine days it got closer and closer to the opening, and on the opening day it said, Earth the Kit, tonight, Levy and Rose. Well, within 10 days, everyone in the East Coast was wondering, what's an Eartha Kitt? Is, it, is it a garden tool or something? <laughs> they made a lot of fun about my name. Yes. And anyway, I was a flop. After five days, and I had worn uh, what they called, they had, Perugia had made a special pair of shoes for me. And I had on a, I remember it was an Alwyn dress. It was white with egret feathers coming from my, well, from here, mm -hmm. and <laughs> and they had waxed the dance floor, mm -hmm. the stage with these new shoes, and nobody knew. I mean, I mm -hmm. didn't know that. Yes. So I did one of my babaloo things, you know, and turned and yes, um, yes. Pow, right on the floor. I I have six stitches in my chin uh -huh. <laughs> from falling on the floor, absolutely flat out. Well, it was an embarrassing situation, but it, blood was squished everywhere. My dress was absolutely blood, blood, blood everywhere. But of course, I don't know how you do that, but somehow or the other, you get up and, and you, you, you go right on with the show. With, mm -hmm. Blood and all. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, Is that what you did? <laughs> yes, I went right on with the show. But afterwards, you know, it got a little bit um, uncomfortable and... Uh, since I wasn't drawing, even though opening night was absolutely fantastically wonderful, it was what you call a star-studded audience, I was cancelled out in about uh, six days. Earth now, the Kit was cancelled out? Well, they didn't know the, me in this country yet. No, right, no they right. didn't know me. They uh -huh. only knew the name, Earth the Kit, but yes. what's an Earth the Kit? Yes. I think they're still saying what's an Earth the Kit. Uh -huh. <laughs> but the Will, uh, William Morris Agency, mm -hmm had taken the six hundred dollars they had uh -huh. they were paying me. Whereby in Paris I was making a hundred dollars a night and that was like thirty five thousand francs a night. Right. Which is a lot of money mm -hmm. for a kid in Paris particularly. Anyway, I was out of a job with my six stitches in my chin, <laughs> which you can get. I think uh, you were insured, so you can uh -huh. get five hundred dollars for yes. the insureds. Yes. Well, in the week time, I was out of a job, mm -hmm. and I was staying with one of my girlfriend's parents mm -hmm. on Convent Avenue in Harlem, mm -hmm. and I feel very uh, disturbed when I cannot pay my own way. So here I am without money, without a job. Nobody's calling you because if you're not successful, you don't see your friends if you have any at that time. That is true, isn't you it? You know, you don't have any friends at uh -huh. that time because uh -huh. their face is also shamed, and therefore they don't want to to keep exercising the embarrassment. You know. Yes. So I went. I remember I had um, a dime. First of all, I called the William Morris Agency up on the phone, and they were yes. at seventeen hundred mm. Broadway. And I, I don't remember which one I spoke to, but it was. Whomever I spoke to, I said, my name is Eartha Kitt. Would I like to speak with someone like Mr. Nat Kalchheim? Right. 
And they said, how do you spell your name? I beg your pardon? Who is it? He said, could you let me talk to Mr. Kalsheim? And then Mr. Kalsheim, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it was Mr. Yes, Kalsheim, yes, but yes. someone like that at the office. And they keep passing me to different people. Mm -hmm. No one in the office remembered who I was. And finally, I had someone, like a secretary, yes. and when she said, I'm sorry, but there's no one here, uh, we'll take a message and have you called back. Uh -huh. And of course, we didn't have a telephone at 128 Convent Avenue at that time. The family didn't have a telephone. So I finally got a hold of somebody, like a secretary, and yes. I said, my name is Eartha Kitt, and I'd like to borrow $25. Were you that broke then, Martha? I've been more broke than that. You must be joking. Uh -huh. Before I got into this business, show business, yes. I, if you want to think in terms of an original bag lady, you're looking at one. Because as a kid coming up from the South after my mother gave me away and all of that, and my aunt realized that uh, I was being mutilated in the South because I'm not the right color, you're not black enough, you're not white enough to be accepted by either side. So mm -hmm. in the family that she gave me to, I was used as a work mule. Mm -hmm. And if there was food, then I got something to yes. eat. But if there was very little food, then I was, I was mm -hmm. treated like the animals and between the dogs, the cats and the birds and rabbits yes. and squirrels. That's how I learned to survive and I ate uh, there is a grass, a wild grass that grows, and it has, I think it's like a scallion. It is like a scallion. Uh -huh. I don't know what the name of it is. But I used to walk through the fields and, and uh, pull this grass, and that's how, one of the ways how I survived. Uh -huh. And I followed the squirrels to see what kind of nuts they ate, uh -huh. and things like hickory nuts. Uh -huh. That's how I survived. So when my, my mother's sister sent for me, I thought my life was going to be, you know, not as bad as that anymore. Yes. Although at the same time, when you really think about it as a child, you think the whole world is like that. You don't know that there is an outside world because we had no newspapers. I mean, a child like myself could not read anyway. South Carolina? Is yes. that where you're from? North, South Carolina. North and yes. South Carolina. Treated like a, like a slave. What do you mean by treating like a slave? Are you saying that you really actually were treated like a slave, Eartha, when yes, you were a child? to the family that I was given to and really? beaten practically every day of my life. That's why my aunt sent for me, because she received the letter and said that they were, if she did not take me out of there, that I would either be beaten to death or they would starve me to death or overwork me. And that's how I got to New York. And when you got to New York, what happened to Eartha Kitt? What first happened to Eartha Kitt? Well, I was living with my aunt who was never married she didn't know anything about taking care of a child. Right. And I think there was too much pressure on her to have this responsibility. Yes. So she too started to beat me. I remember one day, she, well, somebody gave her a box of chocolate and she forgot where she hid them. And she so she accused me mm -hmm. and oh boy, with the strap of the iron, what do you call it, the iron uh -huh. cord? Yes. I got it. Just like they did to me in the South. They used to, the kids in that family that they gave me to used to tie me uh -huh. in a, a potato sack mm -hmm. and then tie me to a tree. And then with a the peach tree switch, mm -hmm. they would enjoy themselves. I and see. they always beat you in the lower parts of your bodies so yes. that nobody can see it because all of, uh, I mean, what am I going to do? Uh, they told me that if I told anybody that I would get the same thing again the next day. Well, I got the same thing again the next day anyway. Yes. So my aunt was actually doing the same thing to me, and that's why I kept running away from her. And I was finding jobs as best I could, eating out of the garbage cans, riding the subways, because the subways Did were you really? a nickel, a a nickel uh -huh. for one way. You and ran away from the beatings. I ran away from the beatings. Uh -huh. And I would stay on the subway for sleeping, because the subway would go from one end of Manhattan to the other. Uh -huh. And with that one nickel, I keep <laughs> running uh -huh. around to Rounds. get into the next when the train was going uh -huh. back in the opposite direction and sleeping on the rooftops. And that's the way I survived. For how long, Eartha? How long did that happen? I really don't remember how long I was in New York. Mm -hmm. I think I came to New York 
it must have been something like 1939. So you got to Europe as a dancer. That's how you got to Europe. That's when the last time I ran away from my aunt, I went for an audition, not knowing what the devil I was doing yes. for the you didn't know Catherine Dunham Company. And I followed the teacher, not knowing of anything. Marvelous. And I won a full scholarship. And that's how I got into the company. I'm actually in show business by... Accident? Accident. By getting the, running away from beating. Running away from beating and starvation. What do you think about America today for our, our black people in America? Are you satisfied with what's happening, Eartha? I want to ask you that. No, I'm not satisfied with what is happening in America. I've been in too many countries to see what is happening over there right. and over there and over there. But no matter what, we still, up to this moment, we, right. we are still the best country. I wouldn't want to live in any other country. Mm -hmm. But we are being dissipated from the inside. I think the system now of the United States that you can come here and find gold on the streets and you can always find a job and so forth and so on and so on. The people of foreign countries, particularly those worlds that we call the third world, yes, come to America and they take advantage of the system. And within 24 hours, they can get on welfare. Welfare, right. And they can get all sorts of, um, mm -hmm you know, come taken care of through the expense of the American citizens. Correct. And therefore, we American citizens are the last ones now, be us black or white. White, exactly. We are the last ones to be able to get the jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might have a great deal to do with the fact that the unions have forced us to think that we cannot work at $5 an hour or $2 an hour. Yes. We must work at $10 an hour or $15 an hour. Yes. And I believe in unions, but the unions, as far as I'm concerned, have gotten to a point where we are not deciding for ourselves anymore as to whether we want to work. I mean, we, the working people, the want to work. The government decides for us today. Do you think so? That's that, that they want us. They want us to decide for, you know, that's... They're, they're the ones, don't you think, Eartha? What do you think? I don't think the government is deciding for anybody. They don't? <laughs> no, I think they're deciding for themselves without the thinking of what is going to for happen non to the... Yeah. For non-thinkers. For non-thinkers. That's what I say. And that's why, economically, we cannot afford to be taken care of a lot of these outsiders anymore. Right. We have to close up our doors and roll uh -huh. up the red carpet and say it's about time we took care of America. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that I think that America talks too much. Every time we get into trouble, one of our politicians or one of the whatever that gets into right. trouble, right. the whole outside world knows about it. And they say, they point a finger at us and they say, what idiots, if that's the way they are in the United States, we will go there and, and do the same, over. and exactly. take over and, take and do over. the same thing. Yes, exactly. I and they're, they're waiting for us to dissipate ourselves from the inside. Yes. Isn't there a saying somewhere along the line by one of the, like Stalin or Lenin or someone like said, that said, we will not have to use guns to take the United States. We will just walk in. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is also a case where we are now being saturated with the, this um, unhealthy mm -hmm. business of AIDS. We are now um, being saturated with an un uh -huh. uh, unhealthy situation of narcotics going mm -hmm. through the streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And something is happening that forces the American people to weaken themselves. I think, don't you think I've heard, I think about the AIDS, I think that someone invented it. I think it was a handmade, and it got out of line. What do you think, Arthur? Do you believe that? Well, I wouldn't like to say I believe it, because it's really too much to think about. It is too much to think about. Yes, but I've heard but that said many, many times before. Uh-huh. Very dangerous. Yes. It's a sad thing. Germ warfare. Yeah. But I'm not saying that it is true, but I've heard it in so many yes. areas. Yes. You travel a lot. You've been all over the world many, many times. Turkey. Tell me about Turkey. You were in Turkey for many years, did you? Yes, I was just in Turkey in January. Uh -huh. But when I first started in the business, too, Turkey. on my own, mm -hmm. 
I was been very curious about obtaining knowledge as best I can. Yes. And since I did not have a quote unquote what they call a formal education. Yes. Every time somebody o o offered me a contract mm -hmm. and they'd say someplace like, "Oh, would you like to go to Turkey?" I was mm -hmm. in Paris of at course. the time. I said, "Oh, Turkey. I remember Turin Turan Bay is his uh -huh. name from Turin the movies <laughs> or somebody like that. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. it's a very curious country. I'd love to go there." But then this was about 1951. I went to Turkey, and I was only supposed to be there for something like, at the most, a month. Istanbul. In Istanbul, mm -hmm. at the Caravanserai. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Omar Kibar was the manager there. The Did owner. they pay you, Ertha? Because sometimes those people do not pay. I know a lot of inter American entertainers worked it and did not get paid after they did their engagement. Did that happen to you? No. They okay. said, when you come back, I'll pay you. But I was supposed to be there only for a month, and six months later, I was still there because Mr. Omar Kibara decided that I was too exciting for them to, yes. to let me go. Yes, yes, yes. So in order to leave the country, you have to have a little piece of paper uh -huh. from the police department. That's right. And that is something that I could never get uh -huh. until Mr. Constantine in Greece called. He said, you know, she was supposed to be here mm -hmm. six months ago. Uh -huh. Where is she? And then Mr. Omar Kibar and Mr. Constantine from the uh, club in, in Athens. Uh -huh started to uh, jiggle each other up yes. and so he had to let me go finally so you've left us to it's also to was a, excuse me skip yes. it, but it was also a very funny story that i didn't know about it was happening at the time but one day someone knocked on the door of my hotel after they had called me and they said that somebody is sending up a present and i, I thought it was the nicholas brothers who had just left there and I opened the door, and I was given this package. Yes. That's about the size of a, a, a man-sized shoebox. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I opened it up, and I thought, oh, it, this is fun. Somebody's playing a joke on me. Uh -huh. It was uh, red jewels and white jewels and pearls and blah, uh -huh. blah, blah. And I thought they were all fake. Uh -huh. So as a joke, I would put something on, and I'd go to the caravanserai in the evening time. And you thought this was... And Mr. Omar Kibar would say to me, Oh, Eartha, how beautiful. Uh -huh. What are those? He was in on the joke with the man who had fallen in love with me uh -huh. and decided that, well, he wanted me to be a member of his harem. Yes, yes. Now, as long as you keep those jewels, it means you, he can come to you at any time. Now, schnooky me, I didn't know uh -huh. anything like uh -huh. that, you know, but uh -huh. I, so I was having a lot of fun with that, what I thought was fake jewels. Yes. Finally, they said to me, you know, you cannot leave the country as long as you have these, these jewels, jewels I see. until you give them back. When you give them back, it means that you have not accepted the position of being in anyone's harem. Ah, so did you give them back? I had to. Did you I get a lot of jewels in your life, travels, meeting a lot of wonderful men, men of the world? You have met a lot. You know, you've met a lot, Eartha. Have you got a lot of jewelry? You're trying to tell me something. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have yeah. you? You got a lot of jewels yes, and furs? And well, yes. Is that very important in your life? It really doesn't sound that important, is it? I think it was more important to my friends than it was to me. Mm -hmm. Because now my friends can say, oh, my friend Eartha has, uh, was given this uh, 25,000 carat diamond yes, yes, ring yes. The other, uh -huh. and things like that. Yes. So every time you get another step on the ladder of success or gain material yes. things or something like that, they feel that they too are successful. Uh -huh. And very often they're the first ones to take it away from you because of jealousy. So I will have been robbed many, yes. many, many, many times. How many albums have you done, Arthur? I don't you, know. You've I don't done count a lot. You've done. Santi Baby, tell me about that. Well, Santi I, Baby was recorded in 1954 by RCA Victor, and it's in an album. It's in an album. But I don't remember what the album is called. But it's a wonderful song. Every Christmas, I, they play that, don't they? Oh, yes. I, I happen to like the like Santa Baby and Old Fashioned Girl and Sissy Bone. Yes, yeah, Sissy Bone. Now you know how Sissy Bone was done. How was I it? I was a, one of the first songs that I had to learn in Paris when I first started out on my own. And the, when, you, when you were in Paris by yourself, yes. you had to learn it. And that because yes. it was the most popular French song, so mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. um, Marwani said to me, yes. I think you should put this song in your repertoire. Oui. 
And then from learning this song with the repertoire, I w went to the Boeuf Salatoire in Brussels. Uh -huh. And there was a matinee in the afternoon. Now, I'm used to working with men. I love to work with men, you know, teasing and all of that uh -huh. sort of thing. But the kind of songs I sing are not easy to tease to a woman, you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course, of course. And when I went out on the stage, it was nothing but women. And I mean, they were Zoftic women with these huge steins of beer, and I didn't <laughs> see one man. And I was so shocked. Uh -huh. I, I lost every lyric in my head. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so I started ad libbing. Uh -huh. And ad libbing and ad libbing and ad libbing, and I got through it. Uh -huh. And it turned out to be so funny that. Uh, Mr. Marawani asked me to keep it keep like it that. And when I came to America, they recorded it exactly uh -huh. as it I was ad-libbed. And that how that song yes. got five gold medal awards. Five. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, Eartha Kitt, looking back over your life right now, mm. do you have any regrets? No, not really. I have regrets for those who did not understand me as well as I would like them to have. But I don't have any regrets. So you because if I did not have the kind of experiences I have had, perhaps I would not have become whom I am. Mm -hmm. And I like me very much because I came through all of those trials and tribulations with, the, with my own sticks getting to the other side of the river sticks. Mm -hmm. And with, with a person who has no family, no guardians of any kind, never taking advantage of men, mm -hmm. using my own wits and my own means of survival yes. in order to survive. I feel very proud of myself. I have not fallen apart, and it was, would have been so easy to have done so. Eartha, why do you say you are a bag lady, the original bag lady? Why do you say that? Or the kid, original bag lady. I mean, it's why? because it's true. Why is it true? What it's mean, true what because it was m part of my experiences. From the day you grew up and the way you brought up. I've why? never grown up. I'm still trying. Uh -huh. And I hope maybe that's what has kept me with a sense of humor. Because for me, I had always had to be somewhat grown up in order to work. I have always been an adult physically, mentally, yes. and now the sense of humor I've always realized was always that of a child who was very innocent, never expecting anyone to do them any harm, and always trying to please. And I still feel that way about myself. Wonderful. So whether it was a bag lady or a cotton picker mm -hmm. or the richest girl in the world, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, I'm still a bag lady because I'm still working in order to survive and I never want to have anybody think of me as a burden. Live alone? Yes. Are you happy? Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Are you happy? Yes, because I'm, I'm not uh, smart enough to be otherwise. Not smart. As long as I have that innocence. You, know? you have a lot. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bert Lang, and I would like to welcome you to Skippy Low Looks at Hollywood. Skip's guests this week are two beautiful and glamorous sex goddesses of the films, Julie Newmar and the last of an endangered species, the blonde bombshell Mamie Van Dorn. Now, without further ado, let's join Skip and his guests. Bert Lang, I can't believe what I'm seeing up here. You would not believe. Mamie Van Dorn and Julie Newmar. Two Hollywood's great beauties. You look wonderful, both of you. Thank you, Skippy. God, tell me, what's new and exciting in your ladies' lives right now? First of all, Mamie, what's exciting? Exciting. Well, I'm writing a book called I Play the Field, and uh, that'll be out sometime. I Play the Field? I Play the Field. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> a present tense. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, and I've been very busy on that for the last year. Uh-huh. So um, I've been 
going back into my life from the time I was born, and it's like old tapes coming back. It's uh -huh. very difficult. I never knew it would be like that, but it was very interesting. Are you doing it all by yourself, or you're having help? No, I have uh, help. I see. Julie Newmark. God, what's exciting in your life, young lady? Well, I saw I'm... you at the party the other day over at Le... that astrologer's house. At, uh, what's his name? Carol, Carol Ryder. Carol Ryder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you look mm -hmm. wonderful. I must yeah. say, are you into astrology? It's interesting. It is? Mm-hmm. So what's exciting in Julie Newmar's life? Right well, now? I was sitting here thinking what I was going to be in my next life. In your next life? Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. What do you mean I by haven't that? made up my mind. I don't know. You were the Catwoman in Batman. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you the original Catwoman? Yes. The original? Eartha was. She came second? Eartha Kitt? Yes. But you were the original. Right. right. How long mm -hmm. were you in the Catwoman? I, mean, I Batman, did six Batman. episodes. Six, huh? They were very witty. Did you, enjoy, I, you enjoyed doing them? I think that's why people enjoyed them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Julie Newmar, how tall are you? You're very tall. You're beautiful. Isn't she tall? To the beautiful, people? and she's well just, proportioned. She stands. She, mm -hmm. oh, she's just beautiful. I just got her out of the car out there, and she is so tall. Oh. I know I was made in Japan, but my darling, you <laughs> are really tall. How tall are you? Um, I'm 5'11". It doesn't look it. Really, 5'11". Mm. Are you from New York originally? No, I was born in Hollywood How? Hospital. You're kidding. You're a California girl. Yes. Now, how did Julie Newmar get into films? My mother was in the Ziegfeld Follies. Ah. So you've been in the business all your life. Yes. Were you born in a trunk? <laughs> no, that's right. You were born in Hollywood. In Hollywood, yeah. <laughs> not, not Sigfield. Quite. She was a Sigfield girl. Yes, she was. Ah, I see. She was